Hello and welcome back everybody to Gemology for Schmucks. My name is Peter Nelson and once again I'm here to tell you everything you need to know about gemstones. Today we're going to be talking about arguably the most important thing that you need to be aware of about gemstones. Whether you're new to the trade or whether you're experienced in the trade, there will always be new treatments or enhancements that you need to keep aware of. So today what we're going to do is talk about what treatments or enhancements are, how to understand them, and then at the end I'm going to give you some thoughts to break down whether or not you feel they're a good or a bad thing, because really it's all up to you. So let's start totally at the beginning. What is a treatment or an enhancement? Treatments and enhancements really are the same thing. They're just different terms. Enhancement naturally sounds like it's a better thing, and some people in the trade consider it a slightly deceitful term because it misleads people to believe that stones that have been treated are better. Better than what? Perhaps better than natural stones. It's a loaded point. Why is it a loaded point? Because really, treatments or enhancements are used to take stones that are at a certain level and make them better than they were. So from that point of view, you could definitely think of it as an enhancement. However, if you're going to compare two stones of the same quality, the natural one with that quality compared to the treated one with that quality are going to be at two very different price points. The natural one, of course, being more expensive. Why is that? Because of the rarity factor, and we'll get into that a little bit more later. In the trade, when somebody says a natural sapphire, that means that this is a sapphire that was dug out of the earth, and the only thing that can be done to it is the simple cutting and polishing that goes along with normal lapidary activities. So a gem cutter can touch it, but nobody else can. None of that voodoo. A treated or enhanced stone has additional processes added to it that make the stone better in some way, shape, or form. Now, there's a lot of different types of treatments or enhancements. Treatments can do one of about three things. It can improve the beauty of the stone, which is of course the goal. A more beautiful stone is going to sell more easily. Or it can affect the durability of the stone. Some stones, for example, some sapphires that are mined out of the earth, have substantial fissures in them. Under the earth, there's a lot of different pressures and temperatures, right? So these crystals are getting jerked around all the time. It's kind of like growing up in a house with about seven boys. Rough. So when you've got this sapphire crystal with all of those cracks in it, all of those fissures, Sometimes they will heat it with certain substances like borax or some kind of flux that will allow those fissures to heal together. So that improves both the beauty and the durability of the stone, but it also lowers the rarity of the stone. Remember, a stone with the same qualities, but naturally coming out of the earth that way is going to be more expensive because it is inherently more rare. If we have one stone out of every thousand, just for example, that has this quality, and you can make another 700 out of that thousand into comparable quality just by putting this treatment on them, then of course these more common stones are going to be less expensive. Are they just as beautiful? Sometimes equally so. So improving beauty, improving durability, and then finally there are some products that do not exist in nature, but with treatments we can bring them into being. For example, something like mystic quartz or aqua aura. These are things that do not exist in nature, but they can be made through science. Give those a little Google later. These are all treatments that are applied to natural stones, but what about synthetic stones? And actually, treatments can be added to synthetic stones as well. For example, star sapphires. There are natural star sapphires and synthetic star sapphires. For synthetics, they have to apply an additional process after the stone is made in order to give it that star. So now we understand that a treatment is something that makes the stone better in some way, shape, or form. Less rare, of course, but perhaps more saleable or more beautiful or more durable. Now, how can we understand whether or not a treatment is good or bad? There's about three factors that I would like you to consider when you're thinking about treatments. Number one is the treatment stable. And what that means is, over time, will that treatment stay in the stone, or is it something that will naturally fade away? There are some treatments, for example, irradiation. They blast the stone with radiation in order to create certain types of colors. This mimics nature. There is natural radiation inside of the earth that creates certain colors. For example, smoky quartz. That is caused by natural irradiation in the earth. It can be mimicked in a laboratory setting as well. Yellow sapphires, for example. Yellow sapphires, sometimes they will take colorless sapphires and irradiate them and it will turn them into yellow. So the first question to ask is, is the treatment stable? Some treatments will naturally fade over time. Some of them are just not durable. We talked about mystic quartz and aqua aura. Those are a coating that go on the outside of the stone. So if they get scratched, for example, then that coating is going to wear away and start to look like a pleather couch. The second question I want you to ask is beauty. How does it affect the beauty of the stone? If this treatment makes the stone much more beautiful, then of course that's going to affect the price point. 
For example, with glass-filled rubies or glass-filled sapphires, you're taking stones that would have been completely unsaleable. They would have been totally opaque. They'd look almost whitish, really dull color. But when they're impregnated with what's typically called lead glass, there's different ingredients that go into different mixtures, but that glass seeps into those fractures in the stone, fills them in, and allows the stone to be much more, at least translucent, sometimes fully transparent. So you're taking stones that would have maybe been unsaleable and made them gorgeous. So you can have huge cocktail jewelry for a much more sliced bread kind of price. What's not to like? So the improvement of beauty in glass filling is definitely an important feature to consider. But is it stable? On its own, yes. But for example, lead glass filling, if you're washing your hands and you're wearing your cocktail jewelry that's been lead glass filled, certain types of soaps will actually eat away at the glass filling and over time, the clarity of that stone will go back down again. Or if you're getting repair work done, for example, lead glass filled stones cannot handle high amounts of heat, especially not in shock. And then the third factor that I would like you to consider is how the treatment affects the rarity of the stone. So let's take sapphire as a perfect example. Sapphires historically for hundreds of years have been heat treated. So oftentimes that will involve certain temperatures of heat over certain periods of time. Different temperatures, different environments, whether it's oxygenating or it's a reducing environment, will create different effects inside of the stone. Certain stones are able to be heat treated and create certain different colors. For example, a milky white sapphire in the right conditions can become a blue sapphire, for example. Nobody wants to buy milky white, but plenty of people want to buy blue. And this is all possible because that stone originally had the potential in it. This isn't like spray paint. You can't just go up and ch -ch 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 and any stone that you want is going to turn into that lovely blue that you're looking for. No, it's about combining a scientific process that allows this stone to unlock its potential. So in rarity, what that means is that this stone is able to be treated, but other stones may not be. So it's still more rare than certain other stones and certain other treatments. For example, we talked about lead glass filling. You can fill a stone with lead glass that has also got something like cobalt in it, which turns it blue. Any stone with fissures can have that treatment done to it. So that means the rarity is very, very low. It's a very common treatment. It's a very common stone. But something like a simply heat-treated sapphire is still quite rare because not all sapphires, even if they are low color, can be treated in this way and become blue. Not all of them can. But as I said before, there are new treatments that are always coming out. One treatment that can add additional elements into the stone and change the color is called titanium diffusion. There are a lot of sapphires with nice blue color that are treated with this titanium diffusion. But because so many more stones can be treated in this way, it lowers the value a lot because the rarity is also much lower. It's much more common. So when we're thinking about treatments, once again, we've got, is it stable? Is it beautiful? Does it improve the beauty a lot? and how does it affect the rarity. And so it's quite a natural reaction for a lot of people at this point to go, no, I will not buy any treated stones, it's trickery. But as long as that treatment is disclosed, is it really trickery? And if it does improve the stone and make it more beautiful, and the treatment is stable, then that also means that the price point may come into a more comfortable place for you. And let's back up a few thousand years as well. Even around the time of Christ, so at the turn of the millennia, into the ADs, there was a man called Pliny the Elder who was writing about treatments that were done even during Roman times. That black stone that you see in a lot of male jewelry that they call onyx is not actually onyx. They should be disclosing that this is a treated stone. Because even in Roman times, they were taking stones that were maybe like this. Now this is onyx, and as you may be able to see, that it's banded, it's white and some areas are black, some areas are even a little bit of brown. But if you want a uniform black stone, it's difficult to get it naturally in the earth with this type of material. This is fairly common material. I personally like the banding, so I, I go for the natural unenhanced version myself. But in Roman times, they wanted uniform black, so they found a way to treat it. Now, one of the features of this stone is that it has lots of tiny, tiny, tiny crystals that are in a tight area that make up its structure. And so what they can do is they can take this stone and boil it in sugar, and then they can boil it in acid. And the acid burns the sugar and turns it to carbon. And what that does is it creates a uniform black color in the stone. So male jewelry today, a lot of it with onyx stones in it, are this material or even subpar versions of chalcedony, which is the same stone, and then they treat it in a very similar way and it becomes uniformly black and it becomes very inexpensive because you can use a large variety of stones to do it. There's a lot of the material available. So it's a very inexpensive option for male jewelry. So it's up to you. Do you prefer the natural look or do you prefer something that is uniform that fits your imagination? 
So you can see there's a wide variety of treatments available. Some of them are stable, some of them are not. Some of them enhance durability, and some of them do not. Some of them make stones that would be completely unsaleable into saleable stones, and very affordable stones because of that. But it's very important to consider how this affects the rarity of the stone, because rarity is always going to go back to price. Pretty much the meeting point between beauty and rarity is what we're going to get our price for gemstones. Of course, with things like demand added in on top. Regardless of how you feel about treatments, just keep in mind that as long as the treatment is disclosed, then everything is fair. It's just your choice of whether or not you want to buy it or not. And I'll even go so far as to say not tolerating any treated gemstones is a lot like saying that when you're looking for a life partner, you don't want somebody that went to school. And what do I mean by that? Some treatments basically just unlock the natural potential of a stone, a lot like going to school. Can you really say that somebody who's got talent is going to be an intelligent, contributing member of society if they don't go to school? Some people just need that extra push. They're not all just uh, talented like me. <laughs> Sorry, a little uh, hubris. Like it. So is it more desirable to have somebody who is naturally smart that hasn't had its potential unlocked? Well, I'm not so sure about that. But it is definitely more rare to have somebody that is like that. So maybe that appeals to some people. Other treatments on the flip side are basically like downloading all your essays off of the internet and that's how you graduated from Harvard. Yeah, that's, that's more like those coatings and things that are not durable. So keep in mind what the treatment is, whether or not it's durable, how it impacts the rarity, and just be open with it. Decide what it is that you're comfortable with, what you think is good, and go from there. Alright, that's all I've got for today on Gemology for Schmucks. Once again, my name is Peter Nelson, and if you've got any questions or comments on treatments or anything to do with gemstones, then leave me a comment down below. I enjoy interacting with you on this. Otherwise, hit that like button, that subscribe button, and tell all your friends about it, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.